This example continues from the first part, and I've added in another locus trait. I've got missing thumbs now. So uh, when we put that uh, information in, I've added the term missing thumb. I've underlined it here in the descriptor, and I've also added a new gene symbol for this. Now, the tricky part here is we can see that it's a sorting uh, in, in, a, in a linked fashion, it's not independent assortment because we would typically see equal numbers of ha having thumbs or missing thumbs along all of the mutations. I've got a, an example in the worksheet that actually has a situation like that. This is not the case. There's no one-to-one -one ratios aside from the ones that we see with the parentals and numbers of fairly similar magnitude all the way uh, along. Now one thing that's happened in this is when we count up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we're missing one of the phenotypic classes, and that would be curled claws all by itself. When we're dealing with three linked genes, we're going to expect to find two double recombinants. Uh, a bent tail and missing thumb is the smallest number we have right here, and there's no number that's similar to five in the list we have. Well, it turns out that the missing class, curled claws, counts as zero. So that's something you might want to look at for your data. You should be expecting eight phenotypic classes. So the smallest number, and I've put it in a triangle here, indicates the one that would be a double crossover. So we are going to take the parental phenotypes, bent tail, cur curled claws, or missing thumb, and we know that's the parents because that's the largest number that we can see in our table by quite a long ways. So this means, although I tell you we, tr we cross three mutant traits, I didn't tell you that one parent had all three traits. Now again, since we have uh, F1 lizards being wild type in appearance, we know all traits that I've listed are going to be recessive. Well, how do we know which parent was which? I can't tell you whether the mother was missing a thumb or whether it was the father, but I do know that one parent was missing a thumb, the other parent had normal thumbs, but had a bent tail and curled claws. The one that was missing a thumb had a normal tail and normal claws. That's the way you can read the logic in one of these questions. Okay, so with the parental information, I know that the F1 would have received one chromosome from each parent. And since each parent was true breeding, and I'm talking about the parental generation here to give us this F1 heterozygote, one of the chromosomes would have the bent thumb mutation, would have the curled claws mutation, that's consistent with what we have up here, and we'd also have the wild type allele for the thumb. So this one has the thumb that we're looking for. We also know that the F1 individual was wild type in appearance, it says so right here, and so it's going to have wild type alleles for the bent tail and curled claws, but it's going to have a missing thumb allele. Now the reason I stacked them one over on top of the other is because I don't want to assign any order to these just yet. So I'm going to put a question mark here so that you know, I know this is just a hypothesis, and I'm going to hypo hy hypothesize that the missing thumb allele is in the middle. And I just chose that because that happens to be the middle one in my list. So if I go bent tail, with a wild type missing thumb allele and then the curled claws allele, if I do a double crossover, crossover here and then a crossover back, my recombinant chromosome is going to have bent tail, missing thumb, and curled claws all on one chromosome. The other one would have wild type, wild type, wild type, but let's just work on the part that I've I indicated in yellow. So when the crossover is done in that region and the crossover is done in that region, the most rare class that I get should have all three mutations all together, and you can see how that was figured out with the color. Now when I look back into my lowest number, oops, I put the arrow in the wrong place, I'll have a bent tail and missing thumb. My number five is not going to work. So this is not going to be a double crossover. I don't get all wild type, I don't get all mutants together. In fact, uh, here's my wild type. It shows up in the class. It's a m m number much larger than this. Okay, so there's a problem here. I can't have missing thumb in the middle. So let's start again with the same outset. We're going to have my heterozygote with all of the alleles. It's heterozygous for all, all of the alleles. And when I put them together, this is the same genotype, but instead of having the missing thumb in the middle, I've decided to put the bent tail locus in the middle and current uh, 
curled claws is here, missing thumb is here. A crossover is going to go through all of these, so like this. And I'm going to have curled claw, normal thumb, normal, um, oh, curled claws, normal tail, and normal thumb. And so when I straighten that out like this and look at the uh, complement, which will be uh, normal claws, bent tail, missing thumb, that's how this is read. When I look up, I see this top one is indeed my curls, curled claws phenotype. That's a, a number zero. That's a double crossover. That works. And just for fun, I'm going to double check this one. And when I compare that to my lowest class here, missing thumb, number five, there's only five of them there. That works as well. So now I have my gene order, and the rest of the mapping is fairly easy. So I'm going to put down my parental classes. So this is one parent. I don't know if that's the male parent or the female parent, but because it's true breeding, then I'm going to put the chromosome like this, and, and it's homozygous, because that's what it means when it's true breeding. And the other parent is going to be also true breeding like this. So that's the P generation that I need to put down. And my F1, I've already figured out, and it looks like this one over here. So that would be the answer to this. Now, if you're doing this for me on an exam, I would expect you to make it a little neater. I'm trying to explain this to you in a movie form. So that's the answer to A. Now let's do B. Let's draw a genetic map based on the data, and I'm asking you to correct for double crossovers, but we won't do that just yet. So the first thing I want to do is write down my uh, gene names, and I'll determine the allele based on what it says over here. So I've got curled, bent, and missing thumb. That's what I have here in my F1. And if it's wild type, I'm going to put a plus beside all three of those. So plus, 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 and, and that's the proper gene order and the proper genotype. Now, the one that's bent tail, missing thumb, curled claws doesn't get any pluses by it. It's all three mutant traits together. Bent tail, missing thumb, I'm going to put a plus beside curled claws because that's not written in the phenotype. Over here, I've got missing thumb, curled claws, missing thumb, curled claws, but bent tail isn't listed, so I'm going to put a plus sign by that. This one only has a bent tail, so curled claws and missing thumb get a plus each and so on and so forth. So hopefully you can see how we do it. And just for fun, I did throw a zero category in here. This is the one that only had curled claws. Um, if I lost you with this, look at part A again. The other video I have, I showed why you would do this. Okay, looking at a parental version here, and I'm only looking at two of the loci because I know that the bent tail is in the middle. Let's just do this region here on, on this arm of the chromosome. And these are in coupling because the mutant traits go together and the wild type traits are going together, so I'm going to call that coupling. And that means anything that's a recombinant is going to be in repulsion, which is a dominant with a recessive or a recessive with a dominant. And just with my highlighter here, I can find four of these. See, that's in coupling. I'm not going to ignore it. Coupling, I ignore it. But that, 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 and that are all crossovers in what I'm going to call region one. So I'm going to put a little region one in the corner here. Now, you don't have to do this on your exam, but I find it very useful. So that tells me how many crossovers occurred between the uh, cur curved claws and the bent tail. Now what about the other side? Now we're going to move over here and focus on the other two. And I'm putting a circle around repulsion to say that the parental version is in repulsion. We've got a recessive and a dominant, and a dominant and a recessive just like this. So that means we're going to look for ones that are in coupling to indicate those that are a crossover in region two. So very faint highlights here. I should have done them darker, but you can see uh, they're in coupling, 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 and coupling. So in region two, uh, these ones are the ones that are now recombinant from this parental um, arrangement. So let's put in our formula, because when you do your rough work, you should always draw your formula. And I'm just going to say here, the distance from curve to bent, because that's the first example I'll do, is the number of recombinants. So these numbers indicated with a region 1, divided by the total number of progeny times 100. So if I add up these number 1s, I've got 5 plus 52 plus 55, and I'm too lazy to draw the 0. It doesn't make any difference. And you divide that by the total number of progeny. And if you do the sum of all these, you get 5,010. So to fill in the rest of the formula here, I've got 5,010 times 100. That's part of the formula. 112 divided by 510 is 2.24 centimorgans. 
And uh, you should probably write down more numbers in here. You'll see why when we calculate interference. Um, but this is the distance between those two loci. That's the region in region 1, the distance in region 1. So using orange to, uh, to go with the colors I've got here, region 2 from bent to missing thumb, add the numbers up, and we get 7.25 centimorgans in region 2. Now I did ask for us to calculate mathematically for double crossovers, and the reason I ask my students to do this is because if you get a different number than what we saw before, we know there's a problem with the data, so I do insist on this particular way of determining the distance. Now, with the distance for the double crossover is going to be all of the single crossovers we, we've got. 182 plus 176 plus 52 plus 55. But we also have to multiply the double crossovers by 2. This is one class, and we've got 0 over here. We're going to ignore that one completely. We've got five of these individuals that have double crossovers, but each of them has two crossovers within them. So to get the proper number, we have to multiply that by two. Now it's pretty much the same formula. We, oh yeah, there's my circle around the double crossovers. And when we divide that by 510 and multiply by 100, we're going to have 475 out of 5010, and that gives us a distance of 9.48 centimorgans. Well, if you add this distance and that distance, okay, uh, let's round this up. So 2.2 .2 plus 7.3 is 9.5. This works really nicely, and that tells us we didn't make a mistake in our calculation. Now, here's the map. I asked you to draw a genetic map, so you have to draw all the distances. Notice I put my curled claws and my missing thumb on either end, and I've put my bent tail slightly closer to cur curled claws. This is a more correct answer than putting it right in the middle because the distance between curled claws and bent tail is 2.2 centimorgans. The distance 7.3 is much larger, and then we can write down 9.48 centimorgans as our distance from the outermost parts. And if everything adds up, then you're pretty sure you're going to get full marks for this, provided you didn't leave out steps. So let's go on a little further. Now notice I changed these distance numbers and I left more decimals in here and that's going to uh, let us avoid rounding errors. So this is kind of rough work part. Now to calculate the interference, what we're asking is if a crossover occurs in region 1, will it interfere with a crossover in region 2? And there are enzymes that are involved in crossing over and if they're occupying this region, they might prevent some enzymes from getting into this region. That would be interference. Uh, you can get a different kind of interference called negative interference where if you start crossing over here, sometimes that promotes the ability to cross over next to it. And it depends on the organism, and it's fairly rare to get negative interference. But when you see a negative number when you calculate interference, that means that you're getting more crossovers than expected. So that theory is an important part of what we're doing here. Now let's just do the math part. If we're going to calculate interference, it's equal to 1, 100%, minus the coefficient of coincidence, which the coefficient of coincidence is the number of observed double crossovers divided by the number of expected double crossovers. We know the observed number is 5, and I just threw the 0 in here, divided by the expected number. Now to determine what this is, we're figuring out the probability of a crossover here times, with the product rule, the probability of a crossover here. Well, these are the decimal versions of the percentages. 2.2% uh, is the same as 0.022 and a 7.2% is 0.072. So if we multiply those in, we'll put in this distance here, the probability of a crossover in region 1, times the probability of a crossover in region 2, times the number of progeny. So that's how many expected double crossovers we should get. And that works out to 8.12. So the interference is equal to 1 minus 5 over 8.12, or 1 minus 0.062, and that works out to about 38.4% interference. And if you're ex asked to explain what that means, that's not done in this demonstration, it's basically the fact that we can see that a crossover in one region reduces the ability of a crossover in the next region. It's a positive number, that means it's positive interference, which means we get less crossovers than we had thought. So an explanation would be sort of a text um, answer to explain how this all fits together.